Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to the second part in the series of Salvation and the Crucified Messiah. We're looking at depth at details concerning the crucifixion and salvation and how they are crucial to Christian theology and beliefs in the world about whether you can believe in a Messiah or not, whether you have salvation by believing in one man's actions of death on the cross or not. Can salvation be found other ways? So you're presenting evidence in a court of law, and you are the judge to decide whether this is in fact true or not. We looked at the last episode at the Council of Nicaea, and we said that the Council of Nicaea, they came together about 300 years after the act of Christ's crucifixion, according to Christianity, and they changed the day from Saturday worship, which the Jews and had always believed in and followed, to Sunday, because they wanted to superimpose the S-U-N and the S-O-N over each other, so as to confuse people because the people before had believed in sun gods or sun worship. We also looked how Superman, the legend, the story, the movie, the comic books, also used the same thing, that uh, Superman or Clark Kent, he received his power from the S-U-N, sun. So whenever he was injured or hurt, he was able to go to the sun, and the sun would empower him, and he could hear everybody's prayers all at the same time. His job was to save humanity. So we see these things happening. We also saw that the Council of Nicaea, that they changed the... The 25th of December, they made changes within their religious community to the 25th of December to make that the traditional day that the birth of the sun god was to place because all the other sun gods throughout history, all the other sun gods that were around also were born on the 25th of December. So Jesus of the Bible had to follow the suit of all the sun gods that had come before. There are over 30 sun gods throughout history dating back hundreds and thousands of years before the story of the Bible that had the same story the sun gods sent to earth, were crucified, resurrected, created disciples, did all these things, and uh, had the birthday on the 25th of December. And of course, the symbol that they chose was the symbol of light, or sun rays, and this was to symbolize God's power, strength over this man-god that was now on earth. So we see many depictions throughout history. If you Google it, if you go and have the internet, you can Google um, solo messiahs. You can put there, not solo as in one, but probably you can use that as well but solo as in the sun, sun messiahs. And you'll see how many you come up with. Mithra is just one, for example, and there are many, many others. Today, the church, whenever they depict a, a holy man or somebody who is sacred or somebody who is special, you'll see that they have a halo, golden light around that person. Even in some of the early depictions of saints and writers and, and early theologians, they were always depicted with a halo around them. And then, of course, like I said, we have many gods from Attis of Ephigia, which is one of the sun gods from early time, um, Dionysus. These were all gods that had very similar things. 25th of December, they were slain because of what they had done. In other words, they were killed. Some of them were even crucified and they were resurrected. Their body was uh, laid into the ground and then somehow resurrected from it, from the ground again. They were divine sons of God. They weren't God himself, but they were always referred to as sons of God. In other words, they were God, but they were the sons of God somehow. And there was always a Black Friday or a Black Mass, the day that, would, they would, that they died, or especially it always was a Friday, and resurrected three days later. And the idea of their death and their eventual resurrection was to redeem man, to save man, to bring salvation to mankind. And of course, they were referred to as sons of God's saviors, the Alpha and Omega, the only begotten son, the redeemer of mankind, the Lamb of God. Many, many of these terms were used. Some of them even turned water into wine. Some of them were able to uh, cast out demons. Some of them were able to uh, raise people from the dead. So we see that many of these gods or messiahs that came before had very similar traits. So we see that the Bible was copied. It was copied directly from these texts. And so we have a look and see what they were doing. The idea was to take people from here to eternity by believing in these demigods or these gods that had created. The idea was to take you from here to eternity. And here to eternity could only be achieved by believing in the salvation that they claimed that you had to have. Salvation was through accepting these gods, by accepting these sun gods as God. And if you accepted these sun gods as God, then you would be able to go to eternity. If you didn't accept these sun gods, you were not able to retain salvation or attain uh, eternity or 
get the reward of eternity by believing in these messiahs that were sent. And so salvation depended exclusively on believing in the solar messiah, which is no different to what we find in the Bible today. Islam is a religion that we do not have to believe this. We don't even encourage you to do this. We know it's not true. All we have to do is believe in the one and only God, that he has, there is no other, that he has no partners, he has no one else that we have to go through. We don't have to go through saints, any people that have died before. We can go directly to Allah. We can speak to God directly. And we have this honor to be able to do that. So what happened before in Christianity is they had an amalgamation of beliefs. What they did is amalgamation. They had like pulled all these different things together. Maybe at home you like to make a stew or soup or maybe biryani. And you make this together and you know you have to put all different ingredients together to get the ultimate result, to have the ultimate taste. And so what Christianity did, it tried to do the same thing and has done the same thing for the last 400 years. Now you ask me, why didn't I say the last 2,000 years? Because the Bible has only been around for about four or 500 years. Before that, the Bible was not available to mankind. So what often happens is Muslims are accused from copying from the Bible. The Quran has been around for 1,400 years. And the Bible has only been around for the average man to read. And, and in the written text as we had it today, the oldest text, about four or 500 years. So we can see who copied from who. So what happens, we find Christianity is an amalgamation of all different beliefs. So Paul of the Bible, who wrote many of the books of the New Testament, we see that he took ideas from different pagan beliefs. So why would Paul do this? Paul was a, a Christian, as you all know. Why would he do this? Well, Paul was both a Greek and he was a Jew and he was a Roman. So he took an amalgamation of all these beliefs, put them all together and combined them into one religion. And so that we can see the Unitarian religion being only one, the Unitarianism of the Jews was perverted and was changed, and it became a religion of Trinitarianism. In other words, God could be three, or perhaps even more. And so the death and resurrection of Christ is, is worked into the religion of Christianity so deeply that the myth and the reality combined and mixed together, and we don't know which is which. And Paul was very, very good at that. But however, Paul had no idea about the doctrine of of crucifixion and resurrection when he wrote many of his books. He only found this out later. And much of the information that he found out was by third party. In other words, the eyewitnesses to the accounts of the crucifixion that was supposed to happen, none of them gave an account. None of them ever wrote anything down. None of them ever passed anything from word of mouth. But third party people, they said that this, this happened and they passed this information on. So if this was a court of law, we would say that that wouldn't be able to be represented or accepted in this court because it's a third party statement. We need it from an eyewitness and there are no eyewitnesses that are around, not even an eyewitness report. It's a third or fourth generation people, three or four generations away from the crucifixion that actually spoke about the crucifixion. So conventional Christian understanding of the crucifixion is derived from gospel accounts and the writings of Paul. These are the stories where Christians get the information of the crucifixion from. But how accurate is the source of this information? How accurate is the documentation that we have within the pages of the Bible? Can we trust the words that are written here? Or is there any doubt on it? So we, we said that many of these writers are third-party witnesses. So is this source, is this book reliable? Can we take this information written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John concerning the crucifixion as trustworthy? In the Bible, it has Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and it says that each of these books were written by their respective people. For example, Matthew wrote the book 100 years after the fact. John wrote it 110 years after the fact. Luke, 75 years. And then 60 to 70 years was Mark, who wrote the book of Mark. All the authors were dead by the time that they were supposedly have written their books. So the theory that these books are written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cannot be possible. So already we've got doubt. All the books that were written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written after the death of the people. So the manuscripts are, were later added who these people were later, the manuscripts had on the heading of them, Matthew, Mark, or the uh, gospel according to Luke or John. They were not there, so the original gospels were not written by the people that they said they were written by. Let's look at the gospel of John. Who wrote John? Do you remember John is like the middle of the road, so we're not taking the one that's the oldest, not the one that's the youngest, we're taking the middle one, just to get a comparison. The book of John was written in Ephesus, and it was written about 110 to 115 years after Christ, his supposed death and resurrection. John of Zebedee, was uh, beheaded by Agrippa uh, I in 44 CE. So that means he was dead for 60 years, and he was killed, and accounts is recorded. He was dead for 60 years, 
Then he wrote the book only. So how is it possible that somebody had his head chopped off and was dead and was lying in the ground for 60 years, was somehow able to put his head back onto his body, rise from the dead, write the gospel, and then climb back into his grave again? It's ridiculous. So we all know that this is impossible. This could not have happened. So John, the writer of the gospel, could not have written the gospel unless he was alive. And he wasn't alive. He was beheaded and dead. So who knows who the actual author is? We're going to take a short break, and inshallah, we will come back and continue looking at who wrote these books in the Bible. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. We are continuing our study of crucifixion and salvation in human history and looking at the relevance it has to Christians and Muslims today. And we've said that already we cannot trust many of the writings because, for example, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all written way after the person died. And we just looked at the Gospel of John and how he was beheaded 60 years before he was supposedly had written the book. So he was beheaded and dead. And then 60 years later, he somehow came out of the grave and rewrote the book. So we know that the book of John was impossible to have been written by John himself. Uh, Bart Ehrman, who is a study at Theologian of Christianity, he says in one of his quotes, he says, He who compares one manuscript to another, no two copies agree in their wording. In other words, when you take two manuscripts dating from the same book or the same writings, Say we had to take the book of Matthew, and we had to take two manuscripts of the book of Matthew and put them next to each other and compare these two manuscripts that were copied. Not one of them agrees in the wording. That means there are so many variations, so many differences, that they don't even agree on the same manuscripts. Today we can take the Quran, we can take the manuscripts dating 600 years ago of the Quran, we can take manuscripts dating 1,400 years ago, and we can put them next to each other, and they'll agree on every single dot every single comma, every single sentence will agree with each other without a difference. Not one discrepancy. However, you cannot do that with any of the Christian documents. Even the copies, you cannot put them next to each other and they'll agree on the wording. In the same quote, Mr. Ehrman says that there are 200,000 and 300,000 variations amongst all the manuscripts. And there are more variations in the manuscripts than there are books in the New Testament. In other words, there are so many variations and so many differences, they're not even in the lines they agree with each other. So how were these books put together? If there are so many variations and so many differences, how were these books put together? Now, the Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, it says, it is safe to say that there is not one sentence in the New Testament in which the manuscripts and tradition are uniformed, or wholly uniformed. In other words, this is, if you pick up the Interpreter's Bible Dictionary, which you can get at any Bible bookshop, so you can go, these are books that the Christians use to study the Bible from. It even says that there are not, not even one sentence in the New Testament that are uniformly aligned, that they agree on what they say from one copy to the next. The original copies of the New Testament books have, of course, long since disappeared. This is what we've also attested by the Bible Dictionary. The Bible Dictionary says there's not even uh, copies of these books around. So many of the original books have gone. They have disappeared. They're no longer around. Somehow they've disappeared. And of course, there are many reasons for why these have disappeared. Some people have claimed that they were disappeared deliberately so that no one could ever find the originals. And they can say, no, these were quoted from the original. That's one way. Some people say they're degraded over time. And there are many different reasons. In the first place, uh, these writings were written on papyrus. This is what we are told. The first place, they were written on papyrus. Later, they were written on parchment. Some people say they were written on clay and so on and so on and so on. But originally, it is claimed they're written on papyrus. Now, the papyrus wouldn't have lasted very long, so it would have decayed and would have disappeared. So the original copies of the New Testament and a lot of the Old Testament are not to be found in its original concept. You only have copies of copies of copies, and they do not agree. So the early Christian community, many of them didn't even know what the Gospels were. They never even heard of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They'd only heard of the writings of Paul. So these original documents that were supposed to date back like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the early Christians had no idea about them, never even heard of these books. So they're only uh, written much later. So if we look at the, the textual criticism, that means we take a text and we start looking at it and we analyze it. We have to see whether this book is reliable or trustworthy or not. It's called textual criticism. Very few people understand what textual criticism is. And textual criticism is a look at the different implements that put together and bring these writings together. We have a look and we see if these writings agree with each other. Uh, who, he, who wrote them? Who rewrote them? Who selected them? Who chose these books? Who chose these chapters and verses to put them together? So that's what we mean by textual criticism. We have a look at can we trust these documents? Who put these together? Why were they put together? Why were these lines chosen and these lines not chosen? 
while it was only 18% of the texts that were found used and the other 82% not used. So we look at that type of thing. Hence, we have to look into the Greek New Testament because the Greek New Testament is nothing more than a, a, an edition of work that has been put together. It's a lectured edition of work, so we, we trust the Greek New Testament more than uh, any other of the Testaments today. Modern Christians use the Greek New Testament, the Greek translation, and they ask, why do we trust these? Because these were put together under election. In other words, we could rename the Bible the elected books of the Bible. In other words, people got together and they decided, how will we put these books together? Let's vote on it, and people voted on it, and they elected what books would be there. So scholars, they sat around a table, and they picked and chose what books would go into the Bible. So there are many different editions. There are many different uh, verses of authenticity, supposed authenticity of the Bible that were put together, and they decided what was more common. So you will see here that I have a Bible, and I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but you'll see on here there's a little symbol. It's a little symbol. looks like a man running, and this is the Bible Society symbol. It has changed over the years. There's been many different symbols written on them, and all the Bibles that are basically approved and recommended have this symbol on it. This one's got a bit of writing in, so you won't see it so much, but you'll see there's a little symbol here, and it says the Bible Society. In other words, it's approved by the Bible Society. Now, you get this in the New Testament and the Old Testament and the combination of New Testament books. You get this in the King James Version, the New International Version, the Living Bible, all the different versions of the Bible, over 2,000-odd versions of the Bible today. You get them, and they all, most of them have that symbol in them. Those who don't have them, they are not really recommended to read because they're not approved by the Bible Society. But the Bible Society is a committee of people that sat around and they said, this book should be in the Bible, this book shouldn't be. Just normal men, born of normal parents, had a normal upbringing, and they decide what books were going to be in the Bible. So they decide, I think we should put this chapter in, we should put this verse in, we should leave that verse out, leave this chapter out. So it was elected. People decided what should go in and what shouldn't go in. But we don't find that today in the Quran. The Quran was put there because it is the word of Allah. No additions, no subtractions, no elections, no voting, no decisions to reinstate it or take this verse out or put that verse in. We have one version, stayed the same. It's not a work in progress. It's a work that is completed. It hasn't changed. Many of the things in the Quran are, are very hard and very straightforward. And uh, people would like to modernize it, but we don't because we are not permitted to. It's the word of God. We cannot change the words of God. If we change the words of God, then we're in big trouble. And we would never do that. Because if Allah makes something His word, we cannot change it. And so today, the Bible, we have different versions and different rewrites and um, interpretations and understandings. Uh, today, you can go to a bookshop and you can get commentaries on the Bible where they explain how to understand the Bible. So the percentage of manuscripts that were changed over the years, each time they were changed, uh, there's about 10 to 15 percent of these manuscripts have actually been used. What I've been told, and I'm not sure if this is 100% true because there's still many more manuscripts being found and gone through, but they say there's about 6,000 manuscripts that only about 10 to 20% of it has actually been used of those, of those 10 odd thousand manuscripts. Now, the first ever edition of the Bible as we have it today, which I said to you before, it might surprise people. Many Christians are under the impression that the Bible has been around for 2,000 years. That's not true. The first ever edition of the Greek New Testament was only available in 1516, and it was available for mankind to read for the first time. And we found that many of the scriptures, many of these verses that are found in the 1516 edition were corrupted manuscripts and compiled of the New Testament were corrupted manuscripts that were not found in any of the other manuscripts that were found. And so we found that these manuscripts cannot be accepted. Many of them are right, yes, the vast majority of the information is true from what we found in the older manuscripts, but a lot of it is not reliable. And so several of the pieces that have been added into those, the early, the 1516 edition of the Bible, were not original. They were not from the original copies. In fact, when I say original, I don't mean the original text because we don't have them, but they're not from the original copies. So 1516 edition wasn't very trustworthy. So the Gospels we find already are unreliable. We can find that the books, first of all, were hearsay, third-hand information. Second, the books were written by people that, that do not want to admit that they wrote the books. Imagine you wrote a document and you gave it through to somebody. Maybe you wrote a police statement to the police and you were not prepared to put your name on it. You wouldn't trust it because you say this is unreliable. So first we found that the text was unreliable because they, the person wasn't prepared to put the name on it. Uh, and also we found that the names that were attributed to those books could not possibly have been because those people were dead, in some cases, over 60 years, some even over longer than that. 
And we saw as well that even those texts that we have only date to uh, the 1516. So they're not very old texts. Um, that was the first time mankind could pick it up and start analyzing for the first time. Now, the Gospels, as we have seen, are unreliable because some of them don't have the same information. They miss out valuable information that the one Gospel has that the other Gospel doesn't have. Now, I'm not going to go into too much depth on that because we've done this in other episodes and other series relating to those Gospels specifically. But there are vast differences between one Gospel and the other. And so no writer of the Gospels was found before 160 AD. 160 AD was the first time any of these Gospels appeared on the scene. So anyone before 160 AD knew nothing about the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, nothing of that was known. So the writers of the books of the Bible um, who wrote before 160 AD, like Paul and others, uh, they had never even heard of the Gospels. They never come across the Gospels. So they had no idea of the crucifixion. They had no idea text-wise that the crucifixion was written about. They had no idea of the resurrection of Christ text-wise because it had never been written. And so the idea of salvation depending on the work of the cross was not a concept that Christians um, up to that time had any understanding of. So if you read many of the commentaries dating to recording the writings of the Paul, you'll find that none of them will say that he understood the, the concept of salvation depending on the cross. So many of the church fathers uh, only started adding this, this part of the doctrine and much later. And still today there are many people who say that salvation can be separate from the cross. But in mainline Christianity, they believe that the two are inseparable. So the resurrection, is it a myth or reality? Taken purely from history, or did it actually happen? What does the text say? What do, what do we find the text saying? What do we find the Bible saying about the resurrection? We, we've seen that the crucifixion, how it was done, why it was done. We're going to go into more detail a little bit later, inshallah. But we're looking at now at the resurrection. Is it a myth or is it a reality? When Paul writes his epistles and uh, the shorter books that he wrote in the New Testament, he had, there's no such thing to him as the resurrection. He doesn't even know about it. This is the first time he's heard about it. And so the Gospels weren't written, so he doesn't know anything about it. He didn't have any source material that he could pick up. So it was something that he didn't even mention. Why didn't he mention it? Because it wasn't part of the doctrine of the church then. It wasn't part of the custom of the people then. None of them knew anything about the resurrection. So this means that the account of the resurrection, that Jesus uh, was crucified and died and was resurrected, was unknown to Paul at the time. And this we get purely from the text. Now people will say Paul might have known or he, might, he, he definitely knew about this. If it, maybe it wasn't written, but it was word of mouth. If it was word of mouth and he knew about this, surely he would have written it into his books. Surely he would have written it into his uh, epistles. No, he didn't because he had no idea about it. He didn't know anything about it. So we see that as we've seen in this series and as we've seen in this part of the episode, that people um, have surmised and guessed and added and subtracted things as they have gone along. It's a work in progress. Now, this is all we have time for today, but in future episodes, we're going to look in more detail and we're going to look, are the Gospels reliable or are they unreliable? And we've already seen a lot of this information. We're going to look at it again, get it into depth. I want you to make sure you have a book and a pen and a copy of the Bible and the Quran with you so you can write these notes down and then be able to talk to your Christian friends and explain it to them. And if you're a Christian, remember, take a good look, understand, and, and find out more and more about what the truth is that you actually do believe in. All we have time for in today's episode, and from me, Arib Islam, look forward to seeing you again, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.